of six. You have joined the Urban Chamber of Commerce, um, and we are, as always, the first Wednesday of every month coming to you with the Global Roundtable. My name is Tiffany Meza Hellor. I am the Global Roundtable host. Every Wednesday, 9 a.m., first of the month, we like to sit down and have a conversation about thinking um, about our small businesses outside of the U.S. globally. And we always love to talk about Africa. Today, we have a few topics we are going to touch on. Before I introduce you to our panelist guests, we are going to be speaking of benefits of international trade, the STEP grant, resources available to help businesses trade internationally. And our guests for our panel today, as always, so excited, of course, Ken Evans, president of the Urban Chamber. And today, our guest, we have graciously been um, brought Mr. Jimmy C. Katuda, founder and CEO of JK and Partners USA LLC. USA, because Mr. Katuda works heavily on the continent. Um, he has a very um, impressive uh, bio. Uh, I was so excited to see all of the work that he's been doing for years. Uh, the founding president of the African Diaspora of Las Vegas, as well as uh, executive board member of the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism. Also, Nevada State Chair of the African Diaspora Development Institute. Welcome, Jimmy. I'm happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. It's a, it's a privilege. It's a privilege and an honor that I take very seriously. And I don't take it for granted. It's really, really good to see my old friend, Mr. Evans here. He and I have had some interesting conversations over the years. So I'm glad that we're able to share on this platform exactly what it is that we hope to achieve in Africa. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. It is very powerful for you to join us. Our viewers, um, we do this virtually on purpose, this global roundtable, because um, we're able to broadcast it on different social media platforms. We're able to record it. We're able to share it for our viewers to watch at more convenient times. And that is a global thing as well. So we shoot this globally. So to our viewers, any questions that you have, please just put in the comment of the platform that, from which you're watching and the Urban Chamber here in Las Vegas will get back to you. Ken, welcome. Of course, um, you and Mr. Katuda have had a very strong relationship over the years. Um, I'm so interested to be able to create this space for Mr. Katuda to give us a little bit of background, um, not just on your, your journey, in community building and development with the diaspora here in Southern Nevada. But also tell us please about your um, consulting. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, by the way, my, my regards to your husband again. Uh, <laughs> uh, where, where do I begin? Where do I begin? Uh, I, I am what you would call a servant of the people. And, and the reason I claim that title and, and graciously embrace it is because I have been fortunate enough to work uh, with very, very uh, committed people such as yourself. Obviously, you, you and I have worked together uh, with the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism. And then, of course, with uh, my brother, Ken. So um, I, I'm, my name is Jimmy Katuta. I am a Zambian. I live in the United States. I've been in the United States since 1993. And uh, it's been a long journey. It's been a long journey. There's been a lot of uh, self-discovery uh, in the sense that when I first started, I was a businessman. And I was focused on uh, making as much money as I can, which is why most of us leave Africa to come uh, to the United States and Europe uh, for greener pastures. But um, I have a very interesting story. I had my father come to visit me when I lived in Sacramento. I owned a car dealership and I had all the toys you can think of, um, the cars, the big houses, the boats. And I was taking my father to my house and we were driving and we went through this big gate, um, driving through the golf course 
and I'm looking at my father in the car, right? And he's just staring straight uh, ahead. And I'm thinking, my father is very proud. This is what I've accomplished. I was, I think, like 36, 36 years old. Uh, we, long story short, we get to my house and we go into my house. I had a really, really big house. And my father looked at me and he said, so let me get this straight. It's just you and your wife, and my son at that time was very small. I think he was like three or four years old. Just you, your wife, and your son. And you live in this huge house. You drive a very expensive car. And your people back home are suffering. Uh, you have people in Africa that uh, have no electricity. They have no running water. You have young children, six, seven years old, walking for miles with buckets of water on their head just so their family can have water. And you over here just living your life like you don't have a home where you belong. And my father said, I'm very disappointed. And that family is what changed my life. And from that time, I, I decided that from now on, what I will do is focus mainly on what I can do for my country and my continent. Uh, because we, those of us that have had the privilege to come to the United States are here for a reason. And we're here to learn and take back the knowledge that we acquire so we can help our people back home elevate standards equivalent to what uh, the USA is. So that's what I've started doing. Um, I started my company, JKM Partners, and we just focus primarily on elevating standards right here in the United States in underserved communities. Uh, I worked with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, on, on a an initiative that he and President Bill Clinton started. This was back in 2008, and this was called Bank on California. And essentially what it was, was to make sure that we reach out into the community and bring out the people from the community, bring them to the table with the banks, with their financial institutions, and make sure that we find uh, a language where we can communicate, because there was a very big miscommunication, people were not obtaining loans from the banks, banks were not giving loans because people had bad credit, but they didn't really look into why people had bad credit. And that was the thing that, that, that we brought to the community and to the bank. And we were very successful. We managed to help a lot of families get back into financial mobility. Uh, a lot of people went back to the banks that we were working with and they were given a second chance financing. So that's just some of the things that we've done that I'm proud of. Uh, and recently, um, I'm also proud to share that uh, uh, Governor Sisolak, right here in Nevada, uh, was gracious enough to appoint me to his Black Advisory Council, which consists of about 10 community development people, 10 leaders uh, from church, from uh, financial organizations, from uh, community centers, everywhere, all over Nevada. And I'm happy to be on that. And I'm so looking forward to what we will do uh, to help the governor get his uh, vision uh, across. So thank you, thank you. Yep, and, and I wanna hop right in and say, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the story you shared, especially about your father, uh, that, that alone was, was well worth uh, hearing from you and letting others hear from you uh, this morning. Uh, Got several things to unpack there over the course of the time that we have left, but let me start first and foremost. Uh, you and I share a vision. We share uh, a legacy project, if you will. Uh, yes. People may sometimes ask me, Ken, why are you so focused on the African continent? And, and, and you just touched on it. It's not lost on me that part of what we're doing here at the Urban Chamber, given the fact that we have a core group of Black owned and African-American owned businesses, as well as African owned businesses, meaning individuals like yourself that have immigrated here, first or second generation, maybe more, and started businesses, it's not lost on me that part of what we're interested in doing is putting back together what was torn asunder 400 plus years ago. So what that means is we need to be not only successfully domestically, and that touches on some of what you talked about with the committees you serve on now, as well as in the past, but we also need to be successful internationally and do some things to make sure that we generate relationships 
relationships, if you will, as our board chair Shonda Newsom would say, that lead to not only commerce, but beyond that community oriented or socially oriented relationships as well. So I really appreciate the fact that you started by sharing your story that at the end of the day, it's not just about what we do with our individual success and accomplishments. There's a greater legacy of putting back together what was torn asunder for the individual and collective benefit of us all. So once again, uh, appreciate you being here. And I also want to just emphasize the fact to others that a lot of times we talk about the importance of strategic alliances and partnerships. What I appreciate is that through the relationship that we've developed, as well as others, the Urban Chamber is aligned with the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism, with the African Diaspora of Las Vegas, as well as some of the other associations and groups and segments of the population. Here's the bottom line. Sometimes there's a divide and conquer mentality that others may have, or you know, they may try to create professional or personal jealousy amongst us. The urban chamber is not threatened by the fact that there's an African diaspora in Las Vegas or that there's an African chamber of commerce and tourism. In fact, we participated in the launch and several celebrations of both groups. Ultimately, our collective strength is through the coming together that we've already been doing and that I anticipate we'll continue to do. So just wanted to unpack those things very quickly and again say, really appreciate you being on the, the show this morning. Plus I appreciate the fact as Tiffany said, others will be able to come in, hear your story, hear your why for what you're doing and then hopefully become a part of what we're moving forward with. So thanks again. Thank you, so important. Uh, one of the main visions of Global Roundtable for myself in being a native Nevadan um, and married to a native African from Nigeria is I'm always interested in creating space for conversation for Africans and African-Americans to come together across the board and to share resource. So yes, your story that you shared Mr. Katuda, when you opened up about your father, exactly. And I think a lot of our um, Black Americans here in America, they need to hear more of that perspective. That's why I love this space um, with Global Roundtable. And I really want to focus and take Global Roundtable moving forward in a series of having conversations with African business owners to open up that conversation with our African American business owners. With that being said, Mr. Katuda, can you tell us a little bit about your recent trip to Africa, your last trip to Africa? And remember to unmute yourself. We're still doing that after all these years. <laughs> no harm, no foul. I do it we're, myself. We're, technology, we're, we're still trying to catch up, you know, we're still trying to catch up. but. Uh, uh, the last trip I had uh, was to Uganda. Uh, we had some opportunities there in the government. You know, the government was issuing contracts and the vice president of Uganda, who is no longer the vice president, uh, His Excellency Edward Sakande came. I hosted him, or rather we hosted him when I was uh, CEO of another uh, nonprofit called ABCD, which stood for African Business and Culture Development. So when he came here, we had lengthy conversations and he was eager and he made it very clear that Africa was really looking forward to doing business with the United States. But there are so many challenges that prevent Africa from doing business in the United States because of obviously the bureaucracy that you have to go through so I said, I took it upon myself. I said, then I guess maybe we have to start on a private sector level. I will go uh, to Uganda and see what opportunities are there. And I did, and we discovered a lot that needed to be done. But what's interesting is my upcoming uh, trip, uh, Tiffany, my upcoming trip to Uganda, uh, rather to Zimbabwe and Zambia. So one of the things that the governor Governor Sisolak said to me when he called me to uh, 
just uh, uh, expresses gratitude for me accepting the position and just to congratulate me. One of the things that he said to me was that uh, he wanted us to work on creating a platform. He wanted us to work in finding a roadmap on how we could do business that brings uh, that brings uh, jobs, that brings stability to the uh, Nevada, uh, Nevada population. So I took it upon myself uh, to make a trip to Zimbabwe. And the reason I'm making this trip was because uh, in May, uh, I met, I had the privilege of meeting His Excellency uh, Tedius Chifamba, who is the ambassador to the United States from Zimbabwe. And he, he and I had several conversations and he brought to my attention that they have a project, they have a gold mine, uh, a very big gold mining company in Zimbabwe that needs uh, investors. And primarily what they need is equipment. And what I focus on is heavy equipment. Uh, I like to make sure that, or rather I would like to see some of this equipment that we have right here in Nevada. Uh, we have big, big uh, leasing companies like Ahern. We have Cashman. And what these companies do is they have this heavy equipment that they depreciate out of their inventory. And then once that equipment is depreciated out of the inventory, then they take it to auction and sell it. So what I'm trying to do is find a way that maybe we can take this equipment here to Africa and bring a uh, practical, I'm using practical for lack of a better word, practical competition to China because Africa, China has really dominated Africa in all areas. Uh, so my focus is mining and agriculture. So if we could get this equipment into Africa, it will not only number one, elevate standards of the people in, in, in Africa by creating jobs, because if we take this equipment, we will empower the small to medium-sized businesses, uh, the small mining companies, as you know, Ken, there are a lot of uh, mines in Africa that are operated by individuals or small co-ops, but they don't have the equipment. So we'd like to see a way where we can get this equipment to them and start a relationship between Nevada as a state and Zimbabwe. And then further than that, I'm going to Zambia. I have the opportunity to meet with some ministers there that are very eager to do business in the United States. Uh, you may or may not know that Zambia has a new president. And this president, his name is Hakainde Ichilema, very, very good businessman, very uh, open-minded in business. So he's been to the United States and he's made it very clear that Zambia wants to do business with the United States. So I'm hoping that with the relationship that we have with uh, the urban chamber, obviously the urban chamber has a lot of resources, not only uh, uh, administrative, but also logistic. So we, we are hoping that we can come together and find a way to get this equipment into Africa. So I'm hoping we can touch on that today and see how we can make it happen. It, it's a very big deal, unprecedented. Uh, so it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take all of us to do this. A absolutely, uh, yes. absolutely. And, and what I wanna interject is two things there. First of all, I wanna mention something that we've shared before. Uh, for those small diverse businesses that are out there, especially our urban chamber members that are interested in making trips like the one that uh, Mr. Katuda is getting ready to embark upon, there are what they call step funds. And step funds are designed to support trade missions and trips, whether they're planned or unplanned, whether there's a governor's office, or economic development staff that attends or not. These stands will, these step funds will potentially help to cover up to 50% of eligible costs for your trade mission trip. So the reason why I want to mention this is because they're reallocated every federal, federal fiscal year. In addition to that, they're built into the Governor's Office of Economic Development International Trade Division. And the Urban Chamber has had several of our members 
that have been able to benefit from these funds. So I want to mention that as a resource to support efforts like those that Mr. Katuta is, is mentioning. And as always, if you want to get more information from the Urban Chamber, 702-648-6222. Again, 702-648-6222. Or you can always send an email to info at urbanchamber.org. That's info, I-N-F-O at urbanchamber.org to follow up on any of the things that we may have mentioned here. Plus, I want to say hello to several individuals that have joined us in the chat room. So let me uh, build on uh, what uh, you brought up about the mining situation. One of the key tenants that we have as a part of our global roundtable, especially as it relates to the African continent, is we want to make sure that whatever commerce is generated is mutually beneficial. And specifically what we mean by that is not only do we want to create job opportunities as well as financial benefits here in the state of Nevada, in addition to that, we want to make sure that the native country population on the African continents, jobs are created there, skills transfers occur there, and beyond that, initial as well as hopefully intergenerational wealth is created within the country on the continent as well. So bottom line is we want a win-win situation. And the way that's going to happen is by us doing things like this. So furthermore, real quickly, I'll break this situation down. When Mr. Katuda brought this to my attention, we immediately reached out to another chamber member. In fact, I want to say thank you to uh, the president for the Nevada Mining Association, Mr. Tyree Gray. He mobilized his staff immediately as well as himself. In fact, he was actually on an airplane, but figured out a way to communicate with us because he didn't want to delay things given the fact that this trade mission is coming up. But we had the initial discussion necessary just as an example to see that, to your point, if the equipment, for example, we have a Cashman equipment here, I'm just using them as an example, but they produce heavy equipment here to support our mining industry. Well, if this equipment comes from the state of Nevada or is produced in the state of Nevada, that creates jobs and financial opportunities here. But then at the same time, if we figure out a way to logistically get the equipment over there and then use it appropriately, plus hire workers, train the workers to use the equipment over there, then we're developing their mining industry over there, plus figuring out a way for them to cultivate, distribute, and I'm sorry, produce and distribute the resources themselves, which will again, create jobs and not only international initial wealth, but hopefully intergenerational wealth over there on the continent as well. So again, mutually beneficial to all. So these are the types of relationships that we want to create. And what I'll go back in time to mention too is one of the best things that happened, not that everybody has to come through us, but in recognition of the need for structure to do things like this, the Urban Chamber signed a memorandum of understanding several years ago between the Governor's Office of, Inter of Economic Development, International Trade Development, Chris Sanchez at the time, as well as Marcel Scheer from the Department of Business and Industry, and I signed it on behalf of the Urban Chamber to lay an initial framework to do things like this. So glad to see us moving forward with this. And I just wanted to provide enough context so that people know we're not saying you have to come to us, but at the same time, if you do come through us, like Mr. Katuda reached out to me and has consistently reached out to me, we'll do whatever we can do to provide you with some infrastructure and possible resources like STEP funds to get started. And I, I echo you, I echo you, my brother, because uh, one of the things that uh, I want us to also look into is, um, for instance, you look at the situation, Nevada being a desert and uh, we are importing everything uh, in the agriculture sector. So imagine a scenario where we were, rather than import uh, fruit and vegetables from Mexico, how about we get them from Africa? Uh, um, Africa, we have all the sun you can ask for. We have beautiful, beautiful, rich soil. Um, so I'd like to see a conversation where we can talk about Nevada, doing business in Africa to where we 
invest in Africa, in the farms, in the agriculture sector, so we can start bringing fruits and vegetables from Africa. That will create jobs, obviously, for the Africans. And for the Nevadans, they get good quality food that's organic, that's really nutritious. So those are some of the things I'd like us to touch on. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mr. Katuda, your position within Southern Nevada and being appointed by the governor uh, to the Black Advisory Council is um, so timely and I'm so grateful because I am going to be able to um, assist you in any way always that we can here at UCC, but you're blazing trails because creating relationships in the import-export logistics of partnering um, product, sharing product between the U.S., Southern Nevada, and Africa has always been um, a subject that can use um, more development. And I think your position uh, with the Black Advisory Council and being um, so involved with all of the organizations here in Southern Nevada uh, is going to break that nut. And thank God, because it's really necessary. You're right. We can get our fruit from Africa. We can get our fruit from Mexico. Um, but getting that equipment from auction, the state of Nevada just gives so many options, more so nationally than a lot of states, uh, where we can export great deals uh, to create great value mm -hmm. with our countries in Africa and our state of Nevada. So it's a win-win. And to our listeners, um, whether you're a member of your local chamber um, out of state, because we do of course have listeners out of state or you are um, a citizen, you know, a resident of Southern Nevada or the state of Nevada, these conversations and these resources is why it's so important to join your chamber. Um, the amount of work that these organizations put together, like Mr. Jimmy Katuda and Ken Evans, um, it's just there's no way you can do it as a small business. There's not enough time. There's not enough um, experience. Join your chamber because your chamber is your resource, your connector, and your networker to the relationships that you need on state levels. A absolutely. And I, and I want to hop in and, and say there, uh, Tiffany, I want to uh, build in build on that in two ways. Uh, first and foremost, one of the things we see at the Irving Chamber of Commerce, we're not saying, in fact, we were just meeting myself and my board chair with a small diverse business owner yesterday, and they've done a lot. They've had they got their business up and running, but they've had some challenges along the way that were normal business challenges. And one of the things we share with them is we're not saying that you can't do it by yourself, because again, they've accomplished a lot by themselves. But if there's an ability to leverage our network to help you more efficiently and effectively achieve that same level of success, by all means, uh, we want to welcome you to avail yourself of our resources. And that not only applies to us, that applies to other chambers across the country. In particular, uh, I know that there are individuals on here that are from Black chambers and African American chambers across the country. By all means, avail yourself of that resource network as well, which leads me to my second point. I want to say congratulations, uh, Tiffany, on your recent uh, appointment, selection, and ultimately hiring with the U.S. Black Chambers uh, Incorporated. Uh, you're an outreach specialist that's part of the uh, SBA Navigator uh, program, of which the U.S. Black Chambers is a hub as part of a hub and spoke model. But here's the idea behind it. Uh, I want to say that I want to applaud Ron Busby and his team, uh, Alisa, Alyssa, uh, and Philip and others, uh, forgive me if I'm not mentioning everybody, but very quickly, what I want to applaud them for is that it was Ron Busby's uh, vision to have a network of Black and African American chambers across the country, not only for our domestic success, but again, for our global success as well. In fact, he's made several trade mission trips himself at the federal and the national level with the thought being, if we're doing the types of things that we're doing locally and statewide within the state of Nevada, and then Mr. Busby and his team are doing what they're doing at the federal level, in particular with 
the congressional delegations, as well as with the U.S. Department of Commerce, which has several entities like the Economic Development Administration, the International Trade Administration, as well as the U.S. Uh, uh, AID, which provides resources. The bottom line is we can create a network that will help us do things like what we're doing more efficiently and effectively. So again, I'm really happy about the fact that you'll continue to be able to participate in your role, Tiffany, as the Global Roundtable Chair to help facilitate conversations like this. But I'm equally appreciative of the vision as well as the implementation of the vision by Mr. Busby and his team, which helps us do what we're doing as well. Gratitude, thank you, Ken. Um, I appreciate you. I am um, learning so much in joining the USBC team on a national level and um, ultimately a global level. Uh, and to our listeners, <clears throat> the state of Nevada has an interesting um, character to it, which you all are very well aware. On a national level, the state of Nevada does really well in um, communicating with state levels to business levels because we are a global hub, right? So I um, am very proud of uh, Urban Chamber um, representing and uh, just definitely blazing trails as well in uh, its structure and its communication and its outreach uh, to their small businesses. So thank you. Um, Mr. Katuda, I you know, wanna bring it back to uh, looking at the work that you're doing, both being um, through African perspective and American perspective. And what I really loved when you were given that um, position with the appointment on the Black Advisory Council and Governor Sisolak was asking you, hey, we need to create, you know, a platform for partnership. Let's create jobs. You said, I took it upon myself and this is what I came up with. Um, I want to talk about what it is your business does here in the U.S., JK and Partners USA LLC, and how you creatively created um, that project as a small business owner, then partnering with the state and using the organizations. That's a beautiful, beautiful orchestration. Please, please explain to us. It's interesting, Tiffany, because a lot of people have been asking me that question. They say, so what exactly does JKN Partners do? What is JKN Partners? And quite frankly, when I started JKN Partners in 2005, I didn't know where it was going to go. Um, I started it primarily to bridge the gap between the financial institutions and the communities they serve, to make sure that we bridge that gap so they can communicate effectively. But over the years, we have evolved to find that uh, the best way for us to grow, and by us, I mean all people of color, right, is for us to have a brand that is respected, that is legitimate. And doing that meant we tap into all the resources. So when I say JKM Partners, what we are is a community development network, which consists of different uh, independent companies, different from different backgrounds. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have educators, we have blue collar workers. We have all of them come together with one vision to work together so we can elevate standards in Africa. Because what we want to see is a middle class, a sustainable middle class in Africa, so that we can stop the brain drain. Right, Because I think where Africa uh, falls short is that we over-educate our children and then we don't have uh, infrastructure to keep them there. So what do they do? They leave because they're making more money where they're going outside Africa. So I felt that if we created a company that created a brand where people can come to for resources, we're like a, more like a chamber in a sense but we're just different businesses all working together as one. So what we wanna see is, we wanna see African-Americans, we wanna see Caribbean-Americans, we wanna see uh, African-Americans, Africans, all of us, all of us to work together and make sure that we bring whatever knowledge we have, whatever our resources are, we bring them under the umbrella of JKN Partners, and then we can present it to everybody else. 
So that's one of the things that we do. And I also want to mention that um, for, in my opinion, uh, for Africa to really, really reach her potential, it's going to take all her children. It's going to take all her children in the diaspora. The diaspora means everybody who is a descendant of Africa that lives outside of Africa, which means you, African-American, which means all of us. And if we don't come together, then Africa will always be looked upon like a, a, a begging a continent. I'm using that word for lack of a better word. So that's why we created that. We wanna make sure that we all work together. We all bring our resources together. And that's why I think I, I, I need to mention some people that have helped me along the way, like Jenny Gachui from the African diaspora of Las Vegas. Uh, she's my sister, she's my baby sister, smart, smart woman. Now uh, you have uh, Yusila, Yusila Kovach, who is now the president. All these are the founders of the African diaspora of Las Vegas. You have Augusta Massey, who you know. You have uh, Chris Uzibe, you have Favor Chico, you have Joe Cato. You have all these people that I partnered with. Um, as myself, I'm just going there building relationships. I've had some people tell me that, well, you know, if you're on this chamber, then you can't be on this one. If you're on this board, you can't be on that one. And I find that to be, uh, uh, not only uh, ridiculous, but it's, it's unfair to us. That's why if you, see, if you know me, if there's an event in Las Vegas, whether it is African-American, whether it is the African Chamber, I'm always there. I support, I give 100%. Right now we have Africa Fest coming up in September. That's another event that people need to look into because you're gonna have people, business people from all over the world coming here to try and find business opportunities. So that's what we're aiming for. Absolutely, and I, and I wanna hop in and say, I really appreciate that. In fact, I'm gonna start with part of your last part first. One of the things I wanna encourage us all to do is when other people are making negative comments or negative energy, do not allow other people to project their limitations mentally or otherwise onto you. I'm going to repeat that again. When other people say, well, you shouldn't belong to multiple organizations or you shouldn't support another organization, do not allow other people to project their limitations onto you. Absolutely. Better yet, encourage that type of cooperation and collaboration. And I'll just share with you, that's the reason why the Urban Chamber has made a concerted effort, but it hasn't just been us, it's been mutual. We have made it a point to support the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism, uh, applaud uh, Fava, as well as Joe Cato. Joe Cato sits on our board and has helped launch and move the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Forward, plus in addition to that, the Africa Fest that's coming up. In addition to that, uh, shouts out to Augusta Massey. There were many of us that supported her in her recent run uh, for judge, and, and that needs to happen as well. I'm not trying to be overly political, but the point I'm making is mm -hmm. we do need to make sure that, you know, we tell people at the Urban Chamber that successful businesses do three things. They employ people, they put resources into the community. And then last but not least, they participate in political engagement and advocacy. So we were happy to see uh, Ms. Massey uh, run for uh, a judicial position the way that she did. But coming back to the partnerships, one of the things we did is we support the NAACP and Roxanne and her team over there. They have a bit more of a civic approach to things, whereas we're more economically driven, but there's opportunities for partnership. So just to give a concrete example of what is possible when you don't allow other people to project their limitations onto you, when the NAACP had an event a couple of years ago pre-COVID, we bought a table, but what we did is we extended an offer for the African Diaspora Las Vegas board to have half the table. It was a great opportunity for us to continue to build that kind of relationship. So again, I'll repeat it again. Do not let other people project their limitations onto you. Whatever way we can cooperate and collaborate, we support what you're doing, Mr. Katuda, and that will only continue. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's definitely a fact. And I think, um, you know, there's always more than enough to go around for everyone. And there's always more than enough work to be done. 
So every different sect, every different organization, every different for-profit, non-profit um, is, is welcome. Because when you're looking at it from a global perspective, then you're not worried about the only thing you want to do is join forces. So you're not reinventing the will and you're not repeating the same work. So joining forces is an abundant global perspective when you're talking about economic and developing partnerships through business on a global level. Absolutely. And the, of the global roundtable. Per perfect. And, the, and, the, and the, then one other thing I wanted to quickly, I want to plant a seed here. Uh, one of the things and the area of concern that I've noted, uh, my background is in uh, civil engineering and beyond that real estate development, a little bit of a finance background. One of the things that I've noted on the African continent is the need for a mortgage industry. Mm -hmm. If you study American history and the way that we have developed, part of the reason why we had a sustained middle class initially is because there was an effort made, especially when service members came back from World War II, to put them in the housing because that was seen as a cornerstone to middle class lifestyle within America. What I want to suggest is that if we want to see sustainable, affordable housing on the African continent, there's a need for a robust, sustainable mortgage industry. So I'm planting the seed here that there is wealth on the continent. We may just need to make sure that it's redistributed so everybody benefits more than just a few historically have. But I'm planning to see that similar to if you study what happened in America, we need to recreate the same thing on the continent, because I agree with you, Mr. Katuda, if we can create a sustainable middle class on the African continent, that will go a long way towards its taking its rightful place in the world from an economic standpoint. Just wanted to get that point in. And I agree. I agree. Uh, because you, you, you have to look at, uh, I'm looking, I have a son. I have a son, he's 19 years old. I'm looking at the future, his children. Um, I, I don't want, and I'm going to say something that most people don't like when I say it, but it is my opinion. I feel that um, as Africans, uh, we suffered a lot uh, during colonization. Uh, a lot of things happened to, to, to us that, we, we, we just just wrench our heart when we think about it, just the torture, the abuse. Uh, it's not, I can't compare it to slavery, but I think the, the mental torture is similar in a way. Uh, what, what the Americans suffered in slavery and what the Africans suffered in uh, uh, colonialism. So what I'd like to do is I want us to start slowly shifting the narrative, okay? Um, that is our history, it's very painful, and we'll, we'll always remember it, but it needs to be in our history books. And we need to focus, what, do we, what will we be talking about 400 years moving forward? Are we still going to be uh, crying about what was, what was done to us? Or are we going to say, look, we have a continent that is vast, that is full of resources. Why don't we educate our children and teach them to be on the offense instead of the defense. We have land, you, you mentioned uh, real estate development. The, the land mass in Africa is unbelievable. If we were to take this knowledge that we have here, we could build an Africa that will be high tech, uh, high quality, and we can have our children live through that, live in that time, in, in that time where they will be proud, they will say, my brother, our fathers, Mr. Ken Evans, Tiffany Myers, uh, Jimmy, Africans and African-Americans came together so that we can have this future that we deserve. So I want us to start slowly, not just a breakfast shift, but I want us to start slowly changing our mindset to our children to say, this is your continent. It's virgin territory, literally. As advanced as Africa is, and believe me, Africa, can you be been there? Africa is advanced. Most people, when they hear Africa, they think hearts, kids with uh, flies on them. Africa is very advanced. But as, as advanced as it is, it's only still about 40% developed, it may be less. So you still have all this land mass that could be developed. So we should be talking about that. 
Abs absolutely. In fact, uh, what I want to build on there is the concept of Wakanda forever. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many of us here that when we saw the Black Panther movie, uh, absolutely, it was entertaining. But if you're an individual like myself, there was a sense of inspiration there of what is possible. To your point, you know, some of the minerals that are mentioned in that movie or in that comic book series are real minerals. Yes. Okay. So there's an opportunity there that if we couple our brain power with the natural resources that are there and control the resources ourselves, there's no limit to what we can achieve uh, through an individual, but more importantly, a collective effort. So my thing is, and again, this is the engineer in me that likes to take concepts and turn them into reality. There is no reason why we can't create Wakanda preferably Wakanda forever on the African continent. But to your point, first step is we have to change the mindset and the mentality. Mm -hmm. And as entrepreneurs and business owners, that's what we do anyway. Uh, one of the things I say, and we say here at the chamber, and this may be a little sensitive to some, but as African Americans or Black, Amer Black Americans in America, we have been socialized to do two things be employees and consumers. So mm. part of becoming an entrepreneur and a business owner is changing your mindset so that you go from being an employee and a consumer to an employer and a producer, whether you're a producer of goods or a producer of services, the bottom line is you are producing something. So all we're suggesting is let's apply that same mentality to the African continent and expand it. Because the other thing I want to mention is that there's a lot of wealth on the African continent. One of the things, and I'm going to plant this seed, that this has been an ongoing effort, not just myself, but I want to say Sonny Bray has assisted me and a few others. We are trying to create a relationship between, I'm going to put this out in the universe because I'm a spiritual person at times. We want a relationship between the urban chamber and the Dan Gotti group. Okay. I'll, I'll put it out there again. For those that are not familiar, please Google, Wikipedia, whatever. Look up Aliko Dangote, A-L-I-K-O-D-A-N-G-O-T-E. He is the richest multi-billionaire on the African continent. But I want to be quick to say he is not the only billionaire but more importantly, he's not the only multimillionaire on the African continent. In fact, we've had several Las Vegans that have immigrated here from Africa. I think we have a few millionaires and multimillionaires that have immigrated here from the African continent. Imagine the power if we pull all that together. So I'm planting some seeds spiritually, but it's because I want us to create Wakanda forever. Wonderful, wonderful. I like that. Thank you, Ken. Um, yes, that is the goal. There is a lot of work to be done. Um, and here at the Urban Chamber, we like to focus on the economic development of capitalism and education and being able to source resource to our small business owners. Now, Mr. Katuda, when people are watching your, this interview and they're listening um, to everything that you are you know, advising, I've heard a few things. First of all, let's slowly work on changing the narrative on perspective when we're talking about relationships and what we can do with Africa. And you also, um, I, I just wanna know, how would you share to our viewers to get in touch with you and what you're doing? How can our community assist you with, um, what it is that you're creating in your new position being appointed. Um, any business owners that are listening and they wanna reach out to you, can you talk to us about what that looks like from your end? Are you looking for anything right now from this community to help you out with this initiative? Absolutely, absolutely sister. And they can get in touch with me through the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, th this chamber, is very, very resourceful. Um, what we need, it's gonna take all of us. This is not something that I can do by myself. It's gonna take all of us to, to, to uh, put our resources together. Some, some of us are experts in certain areas, some of us are not. 
So I believe in the power of the mastermind. So any businessman that has ideas, that's what JK and Partners is about. We want fresh ideas that are focused on making sure that we, number one, we protect our continent. We protect it, meaning we are responsible in the way we do business there. And we wanna bring in people that are forward thinkers. No idea is too dumb, in my opinion. Um, we, between the chamber, the, the urban chamber, uh, between African diaspora of Las Vegas, between the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism, and now there's a new kid on the block, as they say, we have the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is headed by uh, a friend of mine, a brother, uh, King, King Nat with Seneca. So all these are resources we can tap into the NAACP. Uh, anyone that understands that in order for us, in order for us, family, in order for us to really, really reach our potential, it's gonna take a collective effort. Um, like my brother Ken said, let's stop, let's not fall for the okie doke, as they say. Uh, the whole notion that we hate each other, that is nonsense. Okay, that is nonsense. Excuse my language, but this really hurts my feelings because my wife is African American. Uh, you know, my wife Krista is an African American, and when she and I got married, she always used to ask me this question Why do Africans hate African Americans? I said, Guess what? We hear the same thing, right? Uh, so we have to be aware of the enemy. The enemy is going to try and pull us apart because as long as we are apart, we're not going to achieve anything. We are so caught up in gridlock, in conflicts, in things that don't even matter. Instead of understanding that African-Americans and Africans, Caribbean, all of us, we want our children to be the stakeholders of Africa. And so to, to answer your question, my sister, anybody that is in business, anybody that has any knowledge or any technology expertise, reach out to the chamber reach out to the urban chamber. I'll be happy to meet with you there. We could talk on the phone and we find a solution. We find a solution. Africa is the next frontier. I can't stress this enough. And I would hate a situation where 20 years from now, people like it happened with, with uh, cryptocurrency. People say, man, I, I, I was listening to Tiffany, uh, Ken and Jimmy, and they were talking about Africa. I wish I had invested. You can invest and you'll be surprised how little, how little it takes to invest in Africa. Especially if you're based in the United States, the dollar goes a long way. And Africa, you wanna talk about reasonable labor? Africa, a majority, Africa has the youngest population today. We are young, we are energetic and we are hungry and we are, our eyes are open, our children, their eyes are open, they want knowledge. So let's teach them and let's show them what we know so that we can pass the baton to them. Absolutely, and uh, as we get ready to, to, to wrap up here, but before we wrap up, uh, two things I wanna stress is, there's a sense of coming home. I really wanna stress the most fundamental thing that we can do as African-Americans is just go there and visit. Uh, you mentioned how sometimes of uh, different countries or lifestyle is portrayed a certain way. I'm here to tell you when I went to uh, Namibia, for example, I found cities and metropolis, uh, what we would call a metropolis here, booming. And yet there's still opportunities there, as you mentioned, with about 60%, maybe more waiting to be developed. In fact, the situation we ran into in Namibia is that they have resources, but because they don't have a freeway system, they can't transport the resources to the ports in order to conduct import and export. So first and foremost, don't believe the hype, as they say. We need to go there and visit just so that you can see that the quality of life is not what is sometimes portrayed. The other thing that I want to suggest is that I, I share your vision. Uh, the, the time to invest is now, the opportunities to invest are now, whether you do it through the Urban Chamber or through some of the other affiliate 
Asians that we've mentioned, like the African Diaspora Las Vegas or the African Chamber of Commerce and Tourism. And there may be others that we don't even know about. And that's something else, too. If you have a group or an association that you think we should be aware of, mention that as well or bring that to our attention as well. But the bottom line is there's a lot of opportunity there and the time is now. Okay, we cannot continue to complain about what happened. We need to learn from it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should ignore it because those that forget their history are destined or doomed to repeat it. But at the same time, we don't have what we call a victim mentality with a sense of entitlement to go along with it. Nope, we learn from the lessons and we move forward. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate you. Uh, the state of Nevada appreciates you. Um, there's a lot of work to do in this country, and it is always a pleasure to speak about Africa on Global Roundtable here at the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Um, I have been given my warning time. Thank you so much, uh, Urban Chamber. Um, and thank you. Thank you both for coming on and sharing what you know to be true with our local, and national and global black business owners. A absolutely, absolutely. And thank you, Tiffany, again, and congratulations again on your position with the US Black Chambers Incorporated. Uh, I know that you're gonna do some wonderful things because you were already doing some wonderful things, not only with the Urban Chamber, but you have a business as well that participates in import and export. Uh, in addition to that, you are an African American that is married to an African as well. So shouts out to your husband, uh, Patrick, as, as well. Uh, props to him as well. But those are the types of relationships that it's going to take to move forward. One thing I wanted to tease, because we may come back to this at a future segment, is uh, Mr. Katuda and I were talking about a possible opportunity. Here's a frustration, but frustrations lead to opportunity. If you look at the country of Nigeria, they have one of the best and most vast resources of oil, crude oil, in the world. However, literally what happens is they pull it out of the ground, they ship it offshore, it gets refined, and then unfortunately they pay a premium to use their own oil. So there's a possibility that we're having some initial discussions to address that. In addition to that, again, when you do your research on Aliko Dangote, you'll see that he's building a pretty big refinery. But the point is, that's an opportunity, so I'm teasing it for now, and then we may come back to it. But those are examples of things that we can do and participate in, again, in a mutually beneficial manner. So thanks again, Tiffany, and thank you again, Mr. Katuda, for being our guest today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we will see you, our listeners, again, August 3rd, the first Wednesday of every month here, Global Roundtable at the Urban Chamber of Commerce. You guys have an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you and bye, everyone. And we see the chat messages. Thank you for everyone that is tuned in. Please let everybody know that this recording will be on our Facebook Live so they can view it again. You can share it with other individuals. And again, in parting, 702-648-6222 to reach us via phone or info, I-N-F-O at 